Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and Jewish culture is often referred to as Yiddishkeit, by which all of Jewish values and Jewish styles, Jewish food, Jewish menschlichkeit is meant. And of course, what's also meant is the Yiddish language. Though interestingly enough, until rather recently, everyone referred to Yiddish by the word Jewish. People spoke Jewish. My grandparents came from Eastern Europe, Russia and Poland. They spoke Yiddish, but they called it Jewish. They spoke Jewish. And there's a profound insight reflected in the conflation of the words Yiddish and Jewish. For in so many ways, they are synonymous. Now to be sure, not all of Jewish culture is Eastern European Yiddish. There is an entire Sephardic wing of world Jewry for whom Yiddish was not spoken, Latino was. And so the Sephardic community would not tend to refer to the Yiddish language as Jewish. And it's unfortunately taken some time for American Jewry and for the State of Israel to recognize the breadth and the depth and the beauty of Sephardic Jewish culture. At the same time, there is an essence to world Jewish identity that is reflected in and expressed by the Yiddish language, which still is associated with Jewish. Many American Jews, kids growing up, now know little or nothing of Yiddish culture, of Yiddish writers and poets and playwrights. Many people whose parents and grandparents spoke Yiddish, it wasn't passed on to them, to the children and the grandchildren. And so there is a real danger that Yiddish will simply fade away as a real, living, spoken language. Which brings me to my two extraordinary guests on this edition of L'Chaim, each of whom, each of whom, has done and continues to do worlds on behalf of Yiddish culture and Yiddish literature. First, a man you've met many times on JBS, a very dear friend, Avi Hoffman, a brilliant actor, director, producer, TV, films. You may have seen him in a film we've shown many times here on JBS, The Imported Bridegroom, when he was a kid. You might have caught him in a recurring role in the short-lived but terrific series Magic City. And most recently, if you were really lucky, you saw him star in a fabulous off-Broadway production of Death of a Salesman in Yiddish, for which Avi Hoffman was nominated for a Drama Desk Award as the best actor in a drama. And I saw Avi in Death of a Salesman, one of my favorite plays, both to read and to watch. And I told Avi, his was the best portrayal of Willie Loman, the best interpretation of that iconic Arthur Miller character I've ever seen, and that includes Lee J. Cobb, who for a long time was my ideal Willie Loman. He took a... It, it, Avi was simply the best. And Avi is now involved in a spectacular new project involving the Yiddish language and is here to talk about it with me and with his mother, Miriam Hoffman, a profound Yiddishist and playwright of her own. In 1992, Miriam won the Israeli equivalent of a Tony Award for her English to Yiddish translation of Neil Simon's The Sunshine Boys. And she has 10 other Yiddish plays to her credit and often co collaborates with her son, Avi. 
and we're about to hear from both of them the details of a most exciting new Yiddish project. I won't let them describe it. But Miriam, it is an honor to have you sitting at this table. And Avi, my dear friend, how <laughs> wonderful it is to have you back here. Thank, Thank you. you both for joining I me. I love the uh, Mazal Tov for all the work you've done. But before we talk about the project, and I'm not going to mention the name, you'll mention the name. You just got back from Israel. Yes. You did something extraordinary in Israel. We were talking about it a moment ago. Tell me again, what did you just do? What production did you the just... The production was called Songs of Paradise. Yes. That I have written with my friend, Rena Borrow. Yes. Many years ago, actually, Joe Papp was the one that produced it at the Shakespeare Festival. Songs Public of Paradise. Songs yes. of Paradise. How many years ago, Miriam? 89. Yes. 89. 89. Okay. But Songs of Paradise had its life all over. It wasn't just, Right. Yes. And, uh, by the way, whom did it star? <laughs> Several people. It was an ensemble cast. Oh, I please. Di I directed it, <laughs> yes. but it was an ensemble piece. But you've also been in it. Yes, yes. I was right? in the original production. I okay. directed it as well. And you okay. can still see it at the Lincoln Center Film Archive. Yes, the first archive. production at the Public Theater yeah. is there. Okay. Now, you came back from Israel recently as well. Yes. And what were you doing there? Well, I directed Songs exactly of Exactly right. And this was the first time I was not in it, which uh -huh. was quite uh, an experience, to hand it over to a Yiddish theater company, the National Yiddish Theater Company of Israel. Yes. And we had originally done it with five members of the cast. They did it with um, eight members of the cast, four musicians, a beautiful set, High, very highly acclaimed, and it was an extraordinary experience to where hand did it the run? reins over. Yeah, where did it run? All over the country. Well, it, it traveled? Yes, yes, yes. For the, example? Well, it opened in Ramat Gan, and then it played in Tel Aviv, and Haifa, and Jerusalem, and all over the country. Okay. You know, Israel has had its own strange relationship with the Yiddish language. Yes, it has. And for a time, it... it, it Israel sort of looked down it was the meaning uh, of Yiddish because the Chalutz, the pioneer, and you, by the way, you are. Where were you born? In the Bronx. And when did you go to Israel for the first time? 1965. 69. What age? 65, I went for the first time. We visited, <laughs> yeah. and we looked at the wall. We looked at the old city of Jerusalem through a fence. Yes, because... The old city was not yet That's in Israel. That's right, until 67. 65. And then you moved back when? And then we moved to Israel in 1969. And how many years did you live there? I came back to the States in 1977, so okay. eight, nine years. And you speak fluent Hebrew? Yes, I do. And in many ways, although you're not a Sabra, you have the Sabra mentality, you know. Well, it's very. You know, I was 11 years old. Yes. I, I grew up as an Israeli teenager. Exactly. So there's a lot of Israeli in me. Yes. Where did you go to high school? Uh, the Gymnasia Herzliya Tel Aviv. Just fabulous. Yes. So I'm saying to you, you know that there was a history where the early pioneers looked down on Yiddish. It reflected a world they wanted to leave. Right. And even although all of the great founding fathers of Israel came out of basically your Eastern European shtetl life, they, it was in their bones, in their blood, the whole Yiddish kite thing. They want to be Israeli. Right. And they want to speak Hebrew. They wanted the language of Eliezer ben Yehuda. Right. And they wanted to push Yiddish aside. And for a long time, Yiddish was really not embraced in Israel. Now you go there, the two of you go there, to do your play, Songs of Paradise, in Yiddish. And I want you to tell the audience, what was the Isra reaction of the Israeli audience? Um, they had never seen anything like this because unlike most Yiddish theater, which is based on historical, you know, uh, melodramatic, dramatic, uh, musical tellings of known stories, our approach to Songs of Paradise was always the book of Genesis meets Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and so they've never seen anything like that. 
you know, Adam and Eve come out in the Garden of Eden and, uh, you know, sit there to get a tan. <laughs> and Eve comes out and says, when do the stores open? <laughs> and, and, you in know, Yiddish, in yeah. Yiddish. Ven macht man auf der Geschäft? Um, so it took, it took the audience a few minutes to kind of get the sense that what they were seeing was unlike anything they'd ever seen before. And once they accepted that premise, they, they loved it. They just loved it. What was it like for you to see your play done? Not only, I mean, obviously it's always done in Yiddish, but now it's being done in Israel, and you know as well as I the background of Yiddish culture in Israel. So what did it mean to you First to see all, your play being done? We lived in Israel for 10 years. He, he left earlier. And um, it was very difficult for us because we spoke only Yiddish. My child, my younger son, Ben Newman, was born in Israel, and we spoke only Yiddish. He, I spoke Yiddish at the house with my husband. That was the language that we promoted. And uh, the family was terrified. My husband said, what are you doing? You're ruining the children. They this didn't is, like the fact that you were teaching Yiddish. No, no. no. And they said, you're ruining them. And Yiddish is not a language. It has no grammar. It's a Germanic mishmash. And you're, it, the outside is only Hebrew. And you know what I did? What did you do? I took up Arabic <laughs> to show them that Hebrew has this is also a fusion language mm -hmm. like every other language. Mm -hmm. And I came and I told them how you call in Arabic Yad, Ras, Birka, which means knee. Berch. Berch. And that Jews, when they prayed, were on their knees just like the Arabs years ago, many years ago. So Did you they, convince anybody, Miriam? Yes. Oh, good for you. Because they knew if they speak to me another language, I'm not going to answer. Mm -hmm. But who did you teach when you were teaching Yiddish in Israel? Oh, I have to tell you that. Tell me. When we came to Israel, I needed to teach. I'm a teacher through and through. Yes, and by the way, you really have been a teacher of Yiddish. That's your career. That's my career. In addition to being a Yiddish playwright. Yes. Go ahead. And a journalist. And a, and a journalist, yes. 20 years at Columbia University. 25 years. 25, excuse me. <laughs> you were a professor of Yiddish. Yes, all but these But how you, well, then why did he, well, in what way is it in the journalism department? I write for the Yiddish Forward for 35 years. I have a column there. So every, all the stories that I write about, my storage uh, place in my house is full of my articles. Thousands and thousands, <laughs> thousands of, articles. of articles. But in Israel, she decided to teach Yiddish. Children. But First, who I were taught. Your students. All my, I had 60 children. All of them were Sephardic, Moroccan, Iraqi, Sudanese. Not, no Ashkenazi at all. Because? So I asked them, what do you need Yiddish for? The answer was, because we want to be Ashkenazim, mm -hmm. you see. So what was I to bring into class? I wasn't bringing in Shabbos or Yontif. You know, they have it in the air. I translated Dr. Seuss. And we did plays with Dr. Seuss material, full of fun. Because my idea of teaching language is fun, mm -hmm. you see. My mother is very modest. She wrote the quintessential curriculum for learning Yiddish. It's almost 700 pages. It's called The Key to Yiddish, and it's available on Amazon. And it is unlike any, uh, it's not a dry uh, textbook. It's got plays and songs and poetry and, you know, that's how and she... Grammar. Right, and the grammar, of course. Oh, when, when you were accused, or when Yiddish is accused of not having a grammar, is that correct? Absolutely not. Of course not. It's a, a magnificent, vital, lebedeke sprach. It's a... Over a thousand years old. Over a thousand years old, and wonderful plays, and the press, and, the, and publishing was done in Yiddish during the thousand years, which was... Um, 
forbidden in Israel, Ben Gurion's Israel. That's right. And we suffered. I suffered a lot mm -hmm. from it, mm -hmm. a lot. Speaking of, I actually was given a document that was put out in 1951 by the government of Israel forbidding, forbidding Israeli actors and producers from doing Yiddish theater. That's incredible. Isn't that something? That's incredible. And wherever a Yiddish paper was sold at a kiosk, they burnt it down. Or a Yiddish play, they would burn down. <laughs> it was, it was, they were going to create a new Jew. There's no such thing as a new Jew. What's a new Jew? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is no such thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in a restaurant once, and I, there was a table there with people speaking Hebrew, and uh, old people, and one of them said, you know, I got sick, I went to the hospital, and there came these young doctors speaking Hebrew, and I said, I don't want a doctor that speaks Hebrew. I want a doctor that speaks Yiddish so I can trust him. Uh, and these were the same people that burnt down the kiosks. Mm -hmm. When they got old, they regretted it. Mm -hmm. Do you know, by the way, at what point that turned in Israel and all of a sudden there was a, an acceptance of the Yiddish language? Uh, I'm not sure it has just yet. So in that, in, to but a certain extent. But it is extent, beginning. But your play, your production, yes. really is moving Israel in that direction. Well, the, the Yiddish Spiel Theater, which is the National Yiddish Theater of Israel, has been in existence for 25, 30 years. What has changed is that over the past maybe five years, there has been a shift in the attitude where, and very much like what's happening in the United States and around the world right now, that suddenly there is this realization that Yiddish actually has something to offer. It's not just some bastard language. It has a thousand year history. It's got life. It's beautiful. It's, it's rich. It's deep. And now, suddenly, the, the media in Israel, there are movies being made in Yiddish, short movies, longer movies. Um, what's happening here in the United States with Waiting for Godot, Death of a Salesman, The Golden Akala, you know, the folks being a, our new theater company, which we'll talk about. Um, there, and in Berlin, and in France, and all over the world, there is a new recognition Mm -hmm. of the value mm -hmm. of a thousand-year-old language that cannot die. Mm -hmm. It would be so wonderful if the movement you're talking about, the theater that you want to create, and the, the understanding people have of the richness of the Yiddish language, it would be wonderful if it really caught on and that, you know, young Jews were not only taught Hebrew, but were taught Yiddish as well. Right. Um, incidentally, we also recently were together when Avi performed a one-man show of another script. Tell us about that. That was my first play. Your first play. It was yes. called? It was called uh, Reflection. Well, the original name was A Rendezvous, Rendezvous with, with God. God. Yes. And then, after a while, we thought that might be a little too pretentious, so we changed the name to Reflections of a Lost Poet. poet. But it, in Yiddish, it's still called A Rendezvous mit Gott. I have written it many years ago, my first play, probably 30 years ago, I don't know, maybe 40, More. I don't know. 33. Thank you. <laughs> Shane and Dank. No? Um, because I went to the Jewish Teachers Seminary here when I came to America in 1950 from the DP camps, displaced persons refugee camps in Germany. Uh, as a child, I was there. I grew up there, kind of. I was 12, 13 when we came here to America. When you ended up in a DP camp? Yes. Where were you prior to the DP camp? I was born in three installments. In three installments, let me hear them. First time I was born was in Russia. 
on the North Pole, Toborsk, where they're 60 below zero. In Siberia. In Siberia. My father was imprisoned there, as usual, you know, on trumped-up charges, spy. And my mother, he was arrested in their slave labor camp first and sent because he asked the question, what are we doing here? Why are we fenced in with guns pointing at us and working for nothing? And I said, okay, get your things together. I'm going to show you. And they sent him off to Siberia, to Bolsk. My mother was pregnant with me because sex was the only thing that the young boys and girls had. They didn't have enough food. They didn't have, but sex they had enough, and my mother got pregnant. So she followed him. She followed him, and she saw. She realized no child could survive here. So she nagged and pleaded with the, with the, the, you know, with the police or whatever, the military. The child will never survive here. It is not a world that the sun doesn't shine here. It's half a year dark. And she was a short, cute little girl, kind of. And they had pity on her. And they said, I tell you what, the child will be born in June, she said, and will tell the, when the river Irtish thaws, a boat comes in once a year. You can take your husband, you can take your child that will be born, and you can go back to the slave labor camp. Where so it's when good. They, <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> where it's, where it's uh, much better than, you know, it was in Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan, I'm not sure. And when I came, when they brought me there, I was about a week old. They thought that I was just born. So they gave them a second birth certificate with a little pillow, with a little blanket. That was my second birth. The third one took place in the DP camp in Germany in 1947 when America decided they will not let in anyone that was born under the Soviet regime. My parents could go. They were born in Lodz, Poland, but the children cannot go. That was American policy. Yes, at that time. Yeah, Cold War. Overnight, we children were about a hundred of us in camp. We all got American passports, and mine says that I'm born in Lodz, Poland. Mm -hmm. And that's how my third birth took place. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and how old are you in the DP camp? I'm there from 10 to 12, 13, something like that, from 9, okay. 10. Okay, so where were you in 1940? In Russia, and in, as soon as the war was over, we escaped Russia. And that was a plan for the movies, how we did it. Oh, how, tell me quickly. Oh, my God. Yeah, tell me. How did you escape? They decided to lose their Russian passports, bury them. It was just the end of the war, and my mother ran to get a new passport because the Russian passport said they were born in Litzmannstadt, Germany. That's what the Germans called Lodz, Poland. Lodz, Litzmannstadt, Poland, Germany, because he conquered Poland. So she ran to the, to the uh, passport office. When she got there, there were s Russian soldiers, thousands of them, wanting a passport, because you cannot live in, in Russia without a passport. She got to the window at 4 o'clock in the morning, and he said, what do you want? She said, a passport. Where am I going to get you a passport? Don't you see thousands? They all want passports. What I can do for you? I'll give you a document for nine months. What do you want me to say? She said, I want you to say I was born in Lodz, Poland. Oh, sure. The minute she got that little paper, and it was good for nine months, she ran home, woke up my father, and he came running, and he got the same thing. There were no passports. Once we had these documents, they began thinking of how, how to escape, because they knew the, you can't have longevity in a country that, in the Soviet Union, under Stalin. 
Oh, I, I wrote a whole article about how my mother got to Stalin. Anyway, I'm not going to tell you that now. So um, the people in the slave labor camp started coming back, and among them was a friend of my parents whose uh, my mother used to send packages to him with onions. They were losing their teeth there. No, on onions. So when he came back from the slave labor camp, my father said, okay, here's the plan. You go with my mother and my child to Lemberg, Lvov, which is a border town between Poland and Russia. And when you get there, send us a telegram that the child is very sick deathly ill, you must come for us immediately. That's a sign that the border between Poland and Russia is open because the soldiers are streaming back. So we got to Lemberg, my mother, and that was a two-week train, which today takes probably one hour. So we stayed at the house about two, three weeks, and the lady of the house came to us and sent telegrams constantly that I'm deathly ill, come immediately. Never heard from him again. And the lady of the house said, you got to get out right away, because in Russia, you know, the police, well, you have to be uh, registered with the police. You cannot just live in an apartment. So you got to get out. So my mother had to make up her mind. Where is she going? Is she going back to look for my father? Or are we going to leave Russia and go to Lodz? So she decided we're going to Lodz. We took the train. We came to Lodz, her birthplace. And the train stopped. And the soldiers were all over. They came crawling through the windows and doors and roofs. And we couldn't get out. It was raining. And it was cold. And my mother started yelling, let us out, let us out. Let us. One soldier had pity on her. He opened the window, he grabbed her by the, and he threw her out through the window. And all these soldiers that were waiting to get in caught her. Then they grabbed me, and they threw me out, and the soldiers caught me. And he, they also, he, he threw out my pillow, because I slept on the pillow. I was a giant. <laughs> I was always tiny. And so that's how we arrived into large Poland. Soon to be a major motion picture. <laughs> <laughs> Alibi. What would have happened to you if you had not been able to get off the train? We would go back, because we already we saw the gases and all of that. That would have been terrible, wouldn't it? I know. Yeah. Smoke already. And so okay. been terrible well, for good, me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, good for you. Good for you. Yeah. All right, so I want to fast forward for a moment now. The two of you are involved in a very exciting new project, Avi. Tell us about it. Well, the background is you started to talk about Reflections of a Lost Poet, which is the first play my mother ever wrote. And, well, not really, because when I was four, oh, yes. she actually wrote a little musical for me to star in <laughs> called Aleph Avremel. But this which was the real... Which you do in your show. Which I do in my show. Still Jewish after all these yes, years. Yes, correct. Wow, Which we you. also show on JBS. Yes, you do. Um, and so, over the years, my mother and I have collaborated on, on several different projects. Mm -hmm. And eventually we got to Songs of Paradise, mm -hmm. which we did in 1988, uh, several versions before then. And Joe Papp, the great Broadway impresario, um, had, had met my mother and really fallen in love with her. And it was because I interviewed him for the forward, for the Yiddish forward. That's right. how we met. Yeah, and that's it, why he fell in love with And at that particular you moment... You were gorgeous, right? So he fell, in, he fell in love with at him. At that so moment in time, yes. he suddenly rediscovered his Yiddishkeit. That his he was name Jewish. was Yossel Papirovsky. Right. Well, but he always used to say that he was either British or Greek right, or something. Right. You know, he never really acknowledged his Jewishness until around then. And then he met my mom and fell in love with Yiddish, and he Yiddish and Yiddish. And so he agreed to give his name to, the Joseph, to create the Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater, which we did in the 19, late 1980s. Songs of Paradise was our first production. We did it in the Bronx, 
at the Riverdale Y. He came to opening night. I tell this story in, in Still Jewish as well. And he was so taken and so fell in love with the show that he got on stage and said, we're opening at the Public Theater next month. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, but wait, just, you're being seen right now all over America. Actually, we're now being broadcast in Israel as well. On, oh, good. Online, all over the Shalom. world. Shalom. <laughs> Explain to people the significance of the theater and, and what oh that Oh, my meant. God. Well, Joe Papp, Joe Papp was the founder and creator of the concept of Shakespeare in the Park, which was the most brilliant concept of all time, that he were going to do free Shakespeare for the public, in Central Park. And people said, are you crazy? How do you do it for free? He said, that's what I want to do, and he did it. It was very successful, and then founded the Public Theater and the New York Shakespeare Festival, and became one of the greatest producers, chorus line, hair, I mean, you name it. He, today, today, it's Hamilton. Hamilton came out of the Public Theater. So, so that tradition of Joe Papp's brilliant ability to, to discover new and groundbreaking work has, has lasted all these years. And we were lucky enough to, to be with him just before the end of his life when he rediscovered his Yiddish essence, Yosel yes. Papirovsky. Okay. And by the way, what was it like for you when Joe Papp get up, gets up and says, you're now going to be part of my theater world? What a, what was that like we for you? We didn't believe it, and we didn't realize it. It was too good to be true. It yeah. was too good to be true. And uh, his love for the Yiddish theater and for the language yeah. was so unbelievably wonderful. He used to come to the show three, four, five times a week. Yes. We would always see him standing in the corner laughing at the same places. It was unbelievable. And when he came from Argentina once, he, you know, he was traveling and seeing theater and so on. Brought, he brought it to his theater mostly. He called me up from Argentina and he said, are you doing Pesach Seder? I said, yes. He says, I'm coming from the airport straight to your house. No kidding. Yeah. And, and he was there? Yes. Okay. He and At his your wife Seder there. table. Oh, sure. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, you know, just before he died, he called me and he said, Miriam, I haven't eaten anything. Can you make me some latkes? She took him latkes to his deathbed. He yeah. called you? He always called me. He called me every week. Yeah. But wait, what year did he die? 80, 91. 91. No, no, 91. Yeah, 91. 91. At yeah. the age of roughly? 70-something. Okay. Yeah. And one more moment on Joe Papp. What was he like as a person? If he liked you, you were his. If he disliked you, forget, forget about, about it. it. I heard he was a tough guy, wasn't he? He was a tough cookie. I heard him say things to people that I, first of all, I would never say in a million years. But he, he was... He knew what he wanted. And he wanted quality. And he wouldn't he accept less. And if people, didn't matter who they were, whether it was Lauder or Perlman or Israel Bonds or, you know, we had meetings with very significant people trying to raise money. And he'd say, I want you to give me whatever, $100,000. $1 million. <laughs> strong-willed man. Very strong-willed And man. brilliant. And brilliant. And brilliant. And brilliant. And brilliant. And All right, so here he is saying to you back in the... 1989. I want you to be part of my theater. Yes. And then what? Well, we did the show. It was very successful. Ran for eight or nine months at the public. Then it moved across sold the street. Out. Sold out. Rave reviews. Moved to the Astor Place Theater uh, several months later um, before Blue Man Group came in and is there still to this day. Um, and then we played major international festivals in Germany, in Switzerland, in Poland. Uh, traveled all over the world with it. Who financed that? We raised the money. Wow. Yeah. Joe basically said, look, I'm not going to give you money, but I'm giving you my name, and my name is worth a lot. And it was. And it was. And then he got ill, and he passed. And that was the death knell yes. for that time. Mm -hmm. Because no one could continue mm -hmm. the work. And interesting enough, you know, in some ways, it wasn't the right time then. It was too early. It was too early. He was ahead of his time, as usual. But here we find ourselves doing, I find myself doing Death of a Salesman a year ago. And um, I'm in the city, and, and my mother comes in, and we decide to go 
have a meeting with Gail Merrifield Papp, his widow. And, uh, and because of the success of Death of a Salesman, there was suddenly this movement to say, well, Avi, you've done all this great work, and you and your mom have done all these great... Maybe it's time to start something new. And we got a, a six-figure grant from a, a very dear uh, family foundation that, that we know. And we went to Gail, and we sat and said, what do you think about the idea of bringing back the Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater? And she said, I'm on board. Count me in. I said, you could be it. our honorary chairwoman. She said, just put me on the stationery. Let me know what's happening. Fabulous. I'm in. And from then till now, we have been working to bring back this Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater, a non-for-profit. We have a website, josephpappyiddishtheater.org. Um, and I was able to get Songs of Paradise back on the boards at the Yiddish National Theater in Israel, at the, full, at the Yiddish Spiel. Um, Montreal produced my mother's translation of The Producers. And now I, we are producing Death of a Salesman again for one of the biggest international Yiddish festivals in Toronto coming up uh, in a few weeks. And you'll be playing Willie Loman. I am playing Willie Loman, and I'm also directing this time. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And so now I've opened up discussions with the public theater, and uh, Oscar Eustace apparently is very uh, much uh, on our side and potentially has given us his blessing to continue developing a plan to bring the Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater back under the auspices in some kind of association with the New York uh, Public Theater, with the Joseph Papp Public Theater on Lafayette. This is fabulous. It's amazing. It's really, so the public is watching. Your audience is watching. Well, what's it going to mean? First for New York, and what's it going to mean in a larger sense? I have a vision that back in the day, when Yiddish was still very popular, there was a circuit, an international circuit, where you could do something in Yiddish, whether it was a concert or a show or a presentation or poetry or music, didn't matter what it was. You could travel all over the world doing it. Joseph Bulloff, who did Death of a Salesman, did it in Argentina. He did it in New York. He did it in Europe. He did it in Israel. Um, you could take a show and, and travel through Canada, through the United States, Cuba, South America. There were Yiddish speakers throughout Central and South America, Europe, Israel, Australia, South Africa. Right. And I contend, it is my contention, and I'm saying it here first, that that concept now has the potential mm -hmm. to be brought back, where we can create an international circuit for Yiddish and Yiddish language and Yiddish culture, where it doesn't matter whether it's a show like ours here in the United States or a show from Israel or someone in Europe, Daniel Kahn, who does beautiful work in Berlin, um, people in Australia who are doing Yiddish. There are festivals all over the world, and I would like to see the Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater become the central resource for an international revival of Yiddish language and culture. And, and they will be... heard it here first. I th uh, it, is, <laughs> it is so exciting, I get chills. We're talking about, first of all, Yiddish plays, correct? Yes. Yiddish language plays. Yes. And it means there will be more for just the ordinary person. Correct. The audience to f see and enjoy, correct? Yes. Um, and not just Jews, Mike. Yes. Because Death of a Salesman, I, I was fascinated to see the audience of Death of a Salesman include Jews, older Jews, younger Jews, very young Jews, non-Jews. The LGBT community came out in droves. Theater lovers, Arthur Miller lovers, Death of a Salesman lovers. It, it, it's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. and, and for Songs of Paradise at the public theater, there were everybody non-Jews, many non-Jews, especially Notre Dame High School, I think. They came to... And Joe was standing outside and said, uh, Shakespeare's upstairs. Shakespeare's here. 
And they said, no, our teacher said, don't miss Songs of Paradise. Because it was the book of Genesis. It was the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. yeah. By the way, you had a co-writer. Yes, that. Rena Borrow. Yes. Who came up with the idea? You did. We were just talking about it today. Yes. And your idea was to take the stories of Genesis and play with them and then do it in Yiddish, correct? Was there, for example, when Avi describes how Adam and Eve come out and they want to sand, tum, sun themselves, tan themselves in the Garden of Eden, was that taken from something already in existence? Or you, no, 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 you no. imagined that, you created that? I met Rena Berkowitz Borrow at Columbia when I took the um, graduate courses there. And I met her in class. And I said to her, what are you doing with yourself? She said, no, no, no. I said, come on home with me. I'm writing a play. And I think it would be better if two of us would listen to it, because I want to hear, and you want to hear. And she said, who are you writing it for? And I said, I'm writing it for the drawer. But I have a terrific feeling about it. I don't know why. I don't know how. And we sat day and night, and we wrote it until it came out, what came out, and based on the songs of Itzhak Mange. Right. A wonderful poet. Which is a concurring theme. This is a, a theme throughout our You should explain who together. Itzik Munger is. Itzik Munger is probably the most beloved of oh. Yiddish poets. Yes. And my show, Reflections of a Lost yes. Poet, is, I, uh, is where I play Itzik Munger, the life and works of Itzik Munger. That was Munger. my first play. I wrote it. And we both loved him, the Megillah of Itzik Munger, mm. the Chumash leader of Itzik oh, Munger. Oh, he was magnificent. And this is based on his biblical poetry about the book of Genesis. Exactly. So the songs were his poetry. Lyrics. His lyrics. The lyrics. Right. Who wrote his the lyrics. music? Rosalie Giroud. You see, we couldn't get the rights to Dubi Seltzer's music because the union, the actors' union in Israel didn't want to give it to us. Right. They said, bring us over and we'll do it, right. and so on. So Rosalie Giroud, and this was, what, a couple of months before opening. Recomposed the entire Recomposed, show. Recomposed, and she in made a, modern, a yeah. rock and roll, doo-wop, jazz, you know, all yeah. of that. Rap, there's a rap. rap in the show. Yes, very modern. <laughs> Very modern. Yeah. And that's what they, they, they were so puzzled in Israel to hear. The yeah. snake. Who does the rap? The snake in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember the text? Oh, just do, just do uh, a moment of it, if uh, you can. Oh, give me a second. Talk to her. Let me think about it. Do you remember it at all? The uh, rap of the snake? The serpent, by the way, in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden. He's luring Eve because he is a tree, and one hand is a branch, and the other hand is the snake. <laughs> and he's talking to her, little girl. You know. There she said. Who did you take for a spin? I spun me a web with a serpent, she said. We laughed on the virtue of sin. <laughs> you know, something like that. I don't Yiddish, remember the exact Yiddish. thing. Okay. But we did do the entire version in Yiddish. Is there an English version? Yes. Now, here's the interesting thing. The original version we did at the public theater was 75, 80% Yiddish and 20% English. So that we didn't have to do supertitles, there was a narrative. There were interpolations. When it, then, several years ago, I, so, I thought, well, you know, there doesn't seem to be a lot of demand for Yiddish. Why don't we translate the entire thing into English? So we created an entire English version, which I would actually love to do with uh, ethnic minorities, African Americans, Hispanics, because it's, it's everybody. Um, and we did that down in Florida at the Caldwell Theater. It was very well received, and never since. And then when Israel wanted to do it, they said it has to be 100% in Yiddish. So my mother and I actually had to sit for like Amazing. three weeks and retranslate the, the English, the 20% English wow. into Yiddish 
but it had to be expanded. So we took versions from the English version that we had added and turned them into Yiddish to establish this new piece. Okay, okay I assume at some point the Yiddish, uh, the Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater will be able to show us the Yiddish version again. I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. There was a last scene I remember that we wrote. God appears. Which we did not do in Israel. We didn't. We didn't do it here either. Yes, we did. In we Yiddish, did it. We no, did. no, not in Yiddish. We in did it in English. English at the Caldwell. Yeah. I played God. God appeared. On he was so tall and big. He was tall and big. Yeah, I, I, had, <laughs> I was standing, standing on a box boxes. in this huge robe, <laughs> yes. and then the robe tears away. I'm wearing a white tux and tails, top hat and tails, with a cane. And it's like a soft shoe routine that oh goes into Western. Fabulous. The go oh, it was a brilliant, Fabulous. brilliant number that my it mom, Marina, wrote. I can't wait to see it. And maybe somehow the JBS audience will see it. It sounds fabulous. Oh, I hope These so. pieces of it, they're just, just great. Incidentally, right now in New York, there's the Folks Peanut Theater. Yes. Are there any problems with your trying to create the Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater with the fact that there already is a Yiddish theater, the folks being a, it's, it's always described yes. as, the National Yiddish, Yiddish theater. theater. Correct. And that's where I started my professional career, when I was 10 years old at the folks being a. Um, th look, the short answer to your question is no. What, there can't be more than one Indian restaurant on 6th Street? I mean, you know, I think there's room. Um, and there are other Yiddish theaters, smaller, New Yiddish Rep, and, and uh, uh, various other Yiddish theaters. And New Yiddish Rep originated the death of a salesman and waiting for Godot. So I give them a lot of credit. Uh, I, I think what makes it possible for us to all coexist in peace is the fact that the Volksbühne has a very specific kind of mission in, in what it produces. The Golden Ecala that they're doing now very successfully that also got nominated for the Drama Desk, two nominations, uh, Best Revival of a Musical, Best Direction, is based on a, on a piece that was found in a drawer from 1923. So they're doing classic Yiddish theater museum and quality. What we're doing is Joe Papp. Uh -huh. which is groundbreaking, <laughs> modern. modern, groundbreaking mm -hmm. work. We're not trying to recreate the old chestnuts of Yiddish theater, which deserve to have a life, and I think the folks being a, will do those. Um, we're not necessarily doing the work that other theaters or You will have your unique role. We are looking to bring the, men, the, the sensibility of Joe Papp back into the Yiddish theater. Which and is he where we Shakespeare. started. He That's right. He told me, I want Shakespeare and Yiddish. Right. Go, get me zu Shakespeare. Zu sein oder nicht zu sein. Und der Dor liegt der Hund begraben. That's what the dog is he married. Wanted, he wanted Hamlet in Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. I would love to do King Lear mm -hmm. in Shakespeare. A very dear friend of mine, Eleanor Risa, who will be working with us on this project, um, has access to The Tenth Man by Paddy Chayefsky in Yiddish. There are so many There's projects. Isaac Bashevis Singer, Parrots, and we did. Grade. You know, I'd like to see the quarrel that we that I did in English translated into Yiddish. We can translate No, he wrote it originally in Yiddish, Grade. Yes, but not the, the play. The not the play. No. He wrote the, the essay. Play. Yeah. We I did the play in English that was done by Telushkin. Who, who adapted it to the stage. Joseph Telushkin. Joseph Telushkin, Rabbi Telushkin. It's a brilliant piece. Brilliant piece. That's the kind of piece that Joe Papp would have loved to have seen done in Yiddish. Very, very exciting. And that's very. what we want to do, and we will be reaching out to the communities here in New York, in Florida, and around the world, the State Department. Um, you know, because of my work with the, with the Dachau album, I've now been able to connect to the State Department, the International Cultural Exchange Program, um, Israeli Consulate. I want to create this international movement oh, it's wonderful, of, of Yiddish language Very, and culture. It's wonderful. Yeah. By the way, before we end, speak for a moment about the Mendel Hoffman Foundation. <laughs> Look, uh, my, my father, God, Oliver Sholem, 
was an extraordinary man. And he was a very humble man, which is why the Mendel Hoffman Foundation, although it is the umbrella uh, not-for-profit for everything we're doing, um, is not really the main name that's out there. Joseph Papp, Yiddish theater, is the name. Understandably. You know. But my father and my mother both dedicated their lives to the preservation of Yiddish language and culture. My father was the chairman of the Yivo. For 40 for, years. For many, many years. Um, my father was devoted to the Yiddish language and culture. And so when my mother and I started talking about how to do all this, we thought that it would be incredibly, uh, an incredible honor to create the foundation in my father's name. That's lovely. And then use that to raise the money to create, to recreate the F Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater. We also want to create a center for Yiddish culture in New York. Uh, and we even have a building where we want it to happen. Um, so, you know, the idea that someone can put their name on a center for Yiddish culture uh, for New York City that would then once again serve as the resource for an international revival and renaissance of Yiddish and, and Yiddish. Wouldn't that be just fabulous? Yes, it would. And I can see it. I just need you to You know where the building is? I do. You have to find somebody who is committed to it as you are. Correct. With money. Yes. That's and right. for the money, they so get their name on this for building. For all of you people out there in the audience who have the resources to create a renaissance of Yiddish culture around the world, and, and don't be afraid of Yiddish language, because as the promoter of Andreas Bocelli said to me after seeing Death of a Salesman, Yiddish now is like opera. It is accessible to everyone, and with the super titles, everyone can accept it, Everyone can understand it. So you can reach me either through JBS or through the Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater.org website or find me on Facebook. You'll f I'm available and accessible. And because of you, many people have already contacted me. So why don't you join them? Beautifully, beautifully said. All right, so in Montreal, what did you just do? I translated Mel Brooks as the producers. How did that happen? They called me. They sent Who's me a they? script. The Yiddish Theater of Montreal. Right. The Dora said they had the rights. Dora Wasserman. Theater. Yes. They had the rights. Yes. They, they had the rights. the rights. They wanted you to do the translation. Mm, yeah. Well, I'm doing pretty well in yeah, translation. Yeah, of course. So that's. Have you the seen the play one. in New York? Sure. Sure. We saw it together. The, the musical. Producers in New York. We saw it on Broadway together. Nathan Lane, Matthew Broderick. Yes, of course. Of course. But in Yiddish, it sounds better. <laughs> Frühling for Hitler und Deutschland. Keep going. Mette es machen, Mette es machen, nimm sich schneller und mit Kohl. Dieser Jingler, Asa Schida, Lobia. Such a kick to hear a line from one of these shows in Yiddish. It sounds much better in Yiddish, Mel Brooks. Aktionen sind in Menschen. Ja, was da wohl gegessen mit sei? Did you ever eat with one? Actors are human too, yeah? Did you ever eat with one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Yiddish. It was an amazing production. I went up with my mom to see it. And it was truly 40 people in the cast, 17 Fabulous. musicians. I mean, Fabulous. it was huge. Could you ever see it playing at the Joseph Papp Yiddish Theater? You know, I'd it's, love it. if, if those of you out there with the resources <laughs> contact me, we could do the producers Anywhere. in Yiddish in New York. Okay, I want to be at the opening. All right, you're <laughs> okay. there. It has been wonderful having you on. Thank you uh, <laughs> for having us. Well, put, you know, I love your son enormously. And, and since I met him, <laughs> I love him also. Uh, <laughs> and you, my friend, you're yes. doing fabulous, fabulous Thank work. You. And Thank you. you know, Mazal Tov on the Drama Desk nomination. Thank but you. I said to you, I wasn't surprised. 
By the way, you can tell the audience, did I say this before the award was, before the nomination came out? Yes, you did. Did I tell you how fabulous you were? Yes, you did. And maybe this show is going to be again in New York, right? I hope so. Yes, that's the plan. Okay. Well, everybody gets a chance to see you do Willie Loman again. I hope except so. Except you're going to direct it this time. I hope so. All right. Yeah. Well, it is, it's been marvelous. Yeah, herzlichen Dank. Do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Kol du hatzlecha, my Thank friend. You. Only the best. Love you. Thank you so much. Love, love you. Adore you. Miriam and Avi Hoffman, who are helping the world once again become acquainted with and in love with Yiddish, what my grandparents called Jewish, <laughs> what is Yiddishkeit, the essence of Yiddishkeit. And as you've heard, it's not only that Yiddish has to be what was old. Yiddish can also be cutting edge and new. And again, what you heard Avi say, I hope you understand, you go to the to see Death of a Salesman or any other of the shows that he and his mother do. And we just saw the play he did. The first one we called again. What's, what was the play, right? The, the, you, you did this show in the Bronx that we did. Oh, uh, it's a manga. It's, yes, a, it's Reflections a manga. of a Lost Poet. Reflections of a Lost Poet. And there are super titles. So that if you don't know Yiddish, as you would do if you went to the Met, you're watching the super titles, and it's amazing how all of a sudden you don't see the super titles, even if you're reading them. Somehow they merge, as they do with a great opera. And so it's my hope that whether you feel you know Yiddish, you don't know Yiddish, whenever Miriam and Avi have something for us to see, we will be there, you will be there, and you'll enjoy it. And of course, we're going to put up Avi's um, the website one more time. Give the name. JosephPapYiddishTheater.org. There All you go. All one word. Okay. JosephPapYiddishTheater.org. For any of you who want to be part of the revival of Yiddish in the most exciting of ways. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to anything you heard Miriam or Abi say. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub, the Chaim, my friends, to life. Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, 
To Jen, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you 